Oh. 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 He snuck out. Hi, I'm Richland, just a guy trying to help out the monarch butterflies, and when it can make sense to, I'm even willing to have some artificial intelligence help me do it. Don't worry, I'll explain. It's 2024, and we're dealing with the lowest starting number of monarchs in the season that we've seen in the last decade. Details of this are delved more into in the most recent population status video. But to sum up some of the major points, the population had a severe decline compared to the previous year, and the population hadn't exactly been in a very large position to begin with. It's dropped to 0.90 hectares, the lowest we've seen in the last 10 years. This loss seemed to be at least partially due to a large drought, a severe one that occurred in the southern U.S. and northern Mexico before and during the monarch migration, right when they need those nectar-producing flowers to fuel them up the most. This drought, well, it caught many of us off guard, and it showed us something that we kind of already knew, but was still a good stark reminder. Nectar, during migration, is very important. The generation that migrates, well, it needs a lot of energy to do that. To make the migration trip, to survive those winter months, and still have enough energy to also then start the trip back up north and find the sprouting milkweed in the spring. And they gotta squeeze mating in there somewhere too. They begin adult life with whatever starting fat reserves they were able to acquire during their caterpillar life. That's kind of their starting supply of energy. During migration, as they travel, they visit nectar-producing flowers to fuel up along the way. And although flower nectar is essentially mostly just sugar, monarch physiology has evolved a way to be able to turn any of that extra energy into further fat reserves. All of this fat, the starting fat it has beginning its adult life that it acquired as a caterpillar, and any fat it's able to gain along the way is vital. This is the energy that it's going to live off of during those winter months when no food is available. If during migration nectar is not available, let's say a drought is occurring, the monarch's body ends up tapping into some of those fat reserves, burning it for energy to use during the migratory flight. Not enough fat at the start of winter, and even if that monarch made that migratory trip, it might burn through all those fat reserves and starve over the winter, not ever really seeing the spring. Nectar is important for all monarchs, all butterflies, but it's critically important for the migratory generation. And thus it's critically important that they can find flowering plants that are producing nectar during the late summer and fall seasons, during the migratory season. To help out the monarch butterflies, some rear them, some plant milkweed, a lot of us do both. But there's certainly also a third thing that we can be doing, and many of us probably already have. It's by restoring the habitat not just in milkweed, but also in other pollinator-friendly flowering plants. I'm talking about the ones that provide the nectar. And if they are plants that have flowers that bloom in the late summer, or early fall, or throughout fall, it's exactly what they need and a lot more of. Now I know from the comments that are left that many of you have quite the green thumb and are very well versed in gardening. You hear the call to get some fall nectaring plants in your yard? Message received. Four different plants come to mind and you're in the car on the way to the gardening store before this video is even ended. Please don't drive on YouTube. But what if you're like me? I'm no gardener. Hey, I know a lot about milkweed and poison ivy and that's kind of where I tap out. For the most part, I'm a gardening idiot. And what are the best plants that I should choose to accomplish this mission for my yard and my location? That can be pretty specific to the individual. Where you are in North America would definitely influence your best choices. And me? I don't even know my gardening zone. Okay, it's 6A, but I still, I had to look that up for this episode. And that is where artificial intelligence can lend me a hand. And maybe you too, if you're in this situation. Now, of course, this is definitely an optional kind of thing, and talking to your local florist is always a great, excellent option. I am not saying that AI, or at least 2024's AI, can replace the years of experience and knowledge of a true botanist. Not saying that at all. But it can give us a pretty good starting point for what our specific location's needs are. And also, I'm trying to troubleshoot here a little bit. After all, someone watching this video in Northern Ontario, someone in New England, Someone who's near Atlanta, Georgia, might all have the same question. What flowers produce nectar in the fall that monarch butterflies feed from that are specific to my local area? But I don't have the answer to that question for you. It's the same question that I had. So I don't know if you've used AI yet or not, but here's a chance to see how it can be useful for you. I myself personally don't like the idea of outsourcing my thinking. So hear me out, for research tasks, AI can be like having an assistant that you give a job to. I task it with researching a topic for me that might be really specific or complex, something that's not just one quick Google search away. And just like any assistant, I'm going to take the report and I'm still going to go through it and fact check it along the way. 
Hey, as a physics and chemistry teacher, I've already used it to try to see how well does it explain certain topics and concepts. It's pretty versatile, but as of 2024's AI, I do still sometimes find some mistakes. So fact checking is still a must. So anyway, here's the prompt that I gave an artificial intelligence app to research for me. Which exact one is not important? Expect similar results from the leading ones that are out there. Here's what I said. I'm looking to add some plants to my garden, which will benefit the monarch butterfly during the late summer and early fall migration. They need to fit the criteria. Number one, they have flowers that produce nectar. Number two, they bloom in late summer and or throughout fall. Number three, they are a native species to southeast Michigan. Number four, they are a common source of food for monarch butterflies during the late summer and early fall migration. Please produce a list of six options. I don't know, force I have it, I'd still say please to these things. I'm polite. You know, in case Sarah Connor was right. And the six that I got? I don't know if it was in any order of importance, maybe, but number one was the New England Aster. Number two was the Goldenrod, showy variety. Number three was the Joe Pie Weed. Number four, the Purple Coneflower. Number five, it gave me the Swamp Milkweed. And coming in at number six, you might have guessed it, the Common Milkweed. And each even came with a quick description validating why it made the list. I also tried it with a few other locations just to experiment. And while there was certainly some overlap in different areas, I was able to meet some flowers that I had never heard of. Some examples. Shout out to Southern Texas with some Lantana. A beautiful, nearly all year bloomer. North Carolina with their blazing star. A late season bloomer that is quite appealing to pollinators. And the coastal areas of Maryland are home to the beach sunflower. Also an important source of autumnal monarch migration nectar. Now, as with any tool, I need to use this responsibly. Of the list it gave me, some of them I certainly recognized. But three of them, the aster, the goldenrod, and the joe pie weed, those were new things to me and certainly of interest. So I took it upon myself to look into those three a little bit further. My own Google searches, so I certainly could have used AI a little bit more and asked it some more questions. But upon looking further into them, consulting various different sources, I knew a lot more about those options. And when visiting my local florist, well, hey, that's when I got some of the best detailed advice throughout this entire process. It was still from the florist. I'm still much more of a fan of a knowledgeable human, for sure. But because of the AI assistance that I had, I was equipped. I was able to have an intelligent conversation with the florist, ask much more intelligent questions, and feel much less like the uninformed rookie at gardening that I truly am. We already have a section of the yard carved out for nectar flowering plants to help out any and all pollinators. Doing pretty good with the cone flowers. Got that area pretty well covered. And my milkweeds over in this other area doing its thing. So we made a selection and got some new plants. And pretty quickly I got them in the ground with some uh, help from some curious assistants. And I did pass their quality control inspection. So here we are. After much consideration we decided upon the New England Aster to try out first. While not flowering yet, and I don't know if the plant's going to be adult enough to flower this year or not, but it seemed ideal for the fall migratory monarch's needs. According to multiple sources, it seems like this is an especially well-visited, nectar-producing flowering plant, producing nectar well into the fall, even as late as the weeks of October. So as summer carries on and fall creeps forward, in a year where we've had lower starting numbers and perhaps you have a little bit less to do with rearing them, a little bit more time on your hands, if you have the means and the time is right, consider starting or perhaps adding on to your gardening area with some fall nectar producing plants. And if you're not exactly sure where to start, hey, let AI maybe point you in the right direction or your local florist. It's your choice. Whatever option works best for you. And let's celebrate that the monarchs made it through a devastating drought at just the wrong time. And also, let's learn what we can from it. Late season nectar is vital for migration. Let's roll up our sleeves Let's get some fall nectar producing flowering plants in the ground next to our milkweed and let's ensure that the monarchs have the resources that they need to make that long journey in the fall. I'm Rich Lund. Thanks for checking this out. Gardeners, thank you for letting this non-gardener bend your ear a little bit about gardening. And as always, thank you for your efforts in the conservation of the monarch butterfly. I will see you next time.